the, the LHC, it's it, it's the energy frontier. You know, we're, we're making collisions, the highest energy collisions that we've ever been uh, have ever been made in our lab, and it's the only place in the world to look at these types of collisions right now. And we we don't actually know everything that's going on all of the time. Um, that there's a chance that there's some very very rare new things going on. So a lot of people spend their time looking for those rare new things. Um, but also there's a, there's a huge amount of work to do just to make sure that our current understanding of particle physics still works. You know, we, we, we're colliding things at energies that have never been seen before. You know, does our theory still hold? So there's also a huge amount of work to just go in and, and, and measure lots of basic properties to make sure the whole theory makes sense. So the particles are produced, they interact with the detector and we give you digital signals which we then interpret um, in terms of the energy and the momentum and the identity of the particle. Those are all put together to give a record of the whole event, so all the particles that came from that event, and that is shipped off um, to the, the computing grid uh, where the calibrations and things are fed in, so those energies and momentum are as accurate as we can possibly make them. Um, they are stored in, on, on disk somewhere um, with some key properties picked out, like what's the total transverse momentum, what's the number of muons, what's the number of electrons. Someone who's doing an analysis will set some criteria on those kind of properties, so if that event meets their criteria, it'll be pulled out into a subset of, of data that they can look at more closely. Say you were looking for the Higgs boson in one of our, our discoveries, um, which one of the key discoveries was indicated two photons. So you'd, you'd have asked, I want two isolated photons in this event. That's a particular kind of energy cluster in the calorimeter, the electromagnetic calorimeter. So you look at the, the data on this, you pull out all the events that have that. You take those energy clusters, you say, if they came from a decaying particle, what was its mass? You can calculate that. Um, and you plot that mass on the histogram. The number of particles here, and you hope that there's a bump. If there's a, if there's a new particle in there, there'll be a clustering in that histogram around the mass of the new particle. The, the LHC, when it's running, which is usually sort of six to nine months out of the year, uh, it can be colliding protons at a rate of 40 million times every second. Um, so, you know, that's a lot of data already. Most of those collisions are not very interesting. So most of them we, we throw away straight away. Um, uh, and we, we record about 1,000 collisions every second, say. But that means over the course of a year, you know, the LHC is producing, I mean, really billions and billions of collisions. And, we, and we're trying to filter that down to, to, you know, hundreds of millions that we can then go and sort through offline. Um, the reason we, we, we have so many collisions is that, is that we're looking for very, very rare processes. Um, take the Higgs boson, for example. I mean, it, it's only a very, very small probability that you will make a Higgs boson in any proton-proton collision. And so for that reason, you, you've got to look at you know, billions of these things in order to find the few cases where a Higgs boson was produced. Okay, so how does ATLAS work? Um, so uh, we, we have a collision, and coming out of the collision, there can be hundreds of particles. And what we want to know is you know, what, what these particles are, because there can be many different types. And we want to learn as much information about these particles as possible in order to try and reconstruct what's actually happened. So one thing we want to do is try and identify what type of particle that is. So one thing we use is we, we try and measure the charge of the particle, try and measure the mass of the particle, and that can give us some information about what, what type of particle it is. Because there's many different types of particles that can be coming out of a collision, the different components of Atlas measure different things. So by putting them all together, um, you can build up a complete picture of what actually happened. Well, so, so all the particle physics detectors, and, and actually in particular, it's made up in, in, in different sort of concentric layers around the, the, the beam pipe where, where the particles uh, circulate and collide. 
starting from the innermost part, there are, there are very, very thin, very sensitive position sensitive detectors which, which help us to determine the trajectory of, uh, of charged particles. We also have a magnetic field there, and so these charged particles bend, and so we can measure, for example, their momentum, therefore their energies. Then further out, we have uh, thicker and thicker layers of detectors, and, and, and the idea for them are to stop the particles and, and measure the, the, the entire energy of the particles. Uh, these are the calorimeters, and we have the more sensitive ones uh, that are further in, uh, and those are capture more the energy of um, uh, particles like uh, photons and electrons, and then further out, uh, they, they're, 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 they're bigger and therefore not as, as uh, accurate and sensitive as, as, as the inner layers, and, and we use those to stop uh, all the other particles. And then finally, there are, there are some, uh, again, some layers of, of tracking detectors at the very, very end, and, and any particles that haven't um, uh, stop there are, are the so-called new ones. And, and, and As we have over 40 million collisions per second, we somehow need to prioritize which events we actually keep. So also out of those 40 million every second we can keep about a thousand. So, so some filtering online while we're taking these collisions has to happen. We call this uh, the triggering system of, of, of ATLAS. It's a standard thing in all particle physics uh, uh, experiments. And, and we um, basically we, we have a custom hardware which very, very quickly checks um, some interesting features uh, in, 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 in the signals uh, coming from one bunch crossing. And in fact, there's quite a bit, a bit of discussions among the different research groups to figure out what are the most important events to keep. Um, that discussion has to take into account that we need some of the somewhat more boring events um, because we actually need to calibrate the detector, we need to understand the detector. Okay? So there's a certain fraction of events that goes, goes into there. And then, of course, for looking for something new, um, we have signatures. Okay? So, um, clear indications that there is something interesting in, in the detector. And in general, we try to keep those signatures um, very broad so that different kinds of physics would still be showing up in those signatures and would still make it to disk on, onto our uh, data set. Yeah, so when, when we're trying to reconstruct the, these collisions, um, like we need to know the, the particles that are coming out and how much energy they have. So the question is, how do we go from a signal left in our detector to knowing what that means in terms of an energy? So we, we have to calibrate, basically. Uh, we look for signals where we know the, the amount of energy a particle should have, and then we can correlate that with what we've actually recorded and then use that to calibrate our detector. A classic example is the Z boson. So the Z boson can decay into, say, two electrons. Uh, we know the mass of the Z boson very, very well, so we know exactly how much energy these two electrons should be carrying away. And then we go in our detector and see what signals have been recorded, and we correlate that back to the energy that we know we should have seen. The first thing we have to do with our, with our data is, is reconstruct it. So what that means is that we take all, all of the, the signals recorded by our detector for one collision and we try and make sense out of it all, and that's called reconstruction. Um, in the inside of the detector we have these tracking detectors that are technology very similar to the camera on your mobile phone. Right? So they actually have particles passing through those layers, so we're not really recording the light, we're recording the particles passing. And the, the segmentation um, of these detectors is very finely, so we can actually measure the passing uh, to tens of microns. The problem is that we can only measure the passing in several layers, so that means if you have many particles passing through, we just have little dots, not really the trajectory of the particles, and we then need to um, spend quite a bit of computing power to connect those dots to figure out where our particles went. So here you can see the uh, atlas in a tracker and you can see the different layers, these, these white circles that come out. 
So these white dots and these red dots are, are corresponding to hits. So this is saying, oh, we know a particle traveled through this particle detector at this time. So we actually use an algorithm to kind of match up the hits in the tracker to try and see if there's a line that makes sense. And if there is a, a sensible line all the way through our detector that matches up with hits, we say this is a track. And you can see here, this blue line is a reconstructed track. And it matches well with these red dots. You can see that it's quite clear that there was some kind of particle traveling through our detector. What you can do with that is um, you, you can turn that into a picture of what the detector actually saw and you know what the detector looked like during this collision. So you, you know you can draw the detector and you can overlay on that all of the energy signals that appeared in this collision. And that gives you a nice representation of what actually happened. That's very useful for some things, but in terms of analysing the data day by day, we don't really use that because you couldn't sit and you know flick through millions and millions of these pictures just looking for the one that you wanted. So what we do is we, we kind of um, abstract the data a bit more than that to pull out the useful pieces of information. Okay, so the, the collisions that are produced at the LHC, they, they, they can be really messy. You, you can smash two protons together and you can get hundreds of particles flying out. If we're going to you know, dig through these collisions and, and, and try and find something new, it's really, really useful to know roughly what you might be looking for. <laughs> and this is where simulation comes in. So if we have, you know, a theorist can come along and say, I think there's a new particle and it's going to behave like this. Uh, and so then we can simulate that. We can uh, run a computer program which will, you know, virtually collide two protons, produce this imaginary new thing, decay it, and then tell us what our detector would see if this was actually happening. And we can then use that information to, to, you know, to tell us what kind of collisions we need to pick out from the LHC data. And then if we go and pick those collisions out, and well, we don't find any, then we know that this, this new particle doesn't actually exist. It's a real experiment, so unexpected things do happen. Um, usually, unfortunately, so far, usually they've been um, unexpected problems with the detector or, or un unexpected um, glitches, uh, statistical fluctuations which have gone away. Um, what we'd all like to see, of course, is a completely unexpected new physics effect that we, we measure. We found hadrons. So hadrons are particles that contain quarks, and all the ones we know of until recently were three quarks, which is a baryon, protons and neutrons and things, or a quark and an antiquark, which is a meson or a pion. Um, we've actually found recently at LHCB, but also at some other uh, frequency minus machines, um, tetraquarks, which contain four quarks, or two, two quarks and two antiquarks, and also pentaquarks, which have got four quarks and an antiquark. So that's kind of new and sort of unexpected and tells us something about the way the strong nuclear force behaves. There's a lot of interest right now in, in, in what possible signals might pop up at the LHC. Um, part of it is a, is a waiting game. Um, if, if there is a new signal there, it's going to be quite rare. So we, we have to record enough collisions in order to say definitively that there's something there. But going from having no signal to having a definitive thing, there, you know, there's a big gap in between. Uh, and in that space, it's 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 a game of statistics, you know, thing, things can bubble up and down, it can look like something's happening when in fact it's just a bunch of collisions that kind of suggestively clumped in one place. Or if it's a genuine signal it will appear slowly, you'll get a small bump and then a bigger bump and then eventually you'll definitely know there's something there. And we have a, you know, a big job controlling those and eliminating those and keeping a cool head and making sure that we understand the data. And while at the same time, you know, making sure that we are only getting rid of the, the noise and the rubbish, and that if there is something real happening, then we don't miss it. What we're doing at, at the LHC, or even at any of the other particle accelerators that have been built over the 20th century, is is we're, we're doing something that's that's never been done before. I mean, kind of by definition, you know, this is the most powerful particle accelerator ever built. We've got the most complex particle detectors ever built. This this hasn't been done before, uh, and and that means in order to do these things, we, we end up inventing pretty much the technology to do it as we go along, and that means a, lo a lot of things have been produced, 
at, at CERN and at other physics labs around the world. And, and these kind of technological developments make their way into everyday life. I would say, I mean, I've, I've interacted with, a lot with, with people in industry and business, and, the, and from their point of view, the major spinner of what we do is people like you. So it's actually the highly trained, it's the PhD students and the physicists that, that work on these big projects and solve problems on them and then go off and do the same thing for other problems. So it's not the technology, it's actually the training that, that people are provided with that, um, which is a, a very, uh, you know, the people who work on those experiments are very sought after <laughs> in all kinds of applications when they're here. Um, one thing, one thing we've missed in all of this is the immense number of meetings and arguments that the physicists have to have uh, in order to agree um, that what, what, is, um, what they're seeing is right. That's probably, if you want to get a real reflection of what it's like to be a physicist, that's the most important thing you've missed. But other than that, I think it's all there.